This episode is sponsored by quality and innovative Game Boar cartridges. Game Boar shot shells are the choice of world champion David Radulovich and 26 times world champion George Digweed MBE. White Gold and Dark Storm contain precision-made diamond shot, manufactured exclusively in England, and coupled with high-performance smooth velocities, providing less felt recoil. If you are serious about your scores, you have to shoot with the best. When every clay counts, make sure you never compromise. Game Boar is the most decorated feet task and sporting clay shot shells in the sports history. Available now throughout the U.S., exclusively from KL Ammo. Find them online at www.gameboarus.com. Game Boar are simply the champion's choice. Welcome to the Dead Pair Podcast with your hosts, Jason Rambo and Sean Alley. We bring you all things sporting clay. Our focus is bringing new shooters to the sport and helping all shooters by giving you the most useful info from coaches, pro shooters, gun clubs, product and service specialists. The Dead Pair Podcast, what every shotgun shooter wants to hear. Paul? Hey everyone, welcome to the show. I am your host, Jason Rambo. With me, my friend, my colleague, my partner in crime, probably more crime than partner, the man that's large and in charge, Mr. Sean Alley. How are we doing tonight, Jason? <laughs> How are we doing tonight? We're, we're doing great. I even got a little snort in there. You like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm good with that. I'm good with that. Oh, man. I was going to let you just keep going there. Yeah, well, no. You've, yeah, that's enough for you. you, you <laughs> You've had enough. Right, yeah. I don't want to get me too used to all the limelight, right? Man, I am pumped up on our guest tonight. This is so awesome. Big, 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 big time. Yes. Kaylee Browning, Olympic silver medalist. Can you imagine on the Dead Pair podcast, we're going to have an Olympian. That's going to be our first uh, Olympic medalist winner. Yes. And Olympic competitor. Yes. So. What an honor. I, I, I yeah, I'm I'm really looking forward to this. This yeah. is going to be cool. She's yeah. going to have a lot of neat things to say and uh, hopefully tell us some cool stories about Tokyo and the Olympics. Oh, man. Can you, I just can't think what it's like for us going across country to a shoot. She went across the world. Yeah, I shoot, know. Right? I know. Yeah, some of these people are pretty blessed with being able to go shoot in different countries like like David and you know he went to shoot the feet task and I, I mean that's that's a whole nother level we're talking we're excited because we're going to the nationals we're excited because we're going to a regional these people are traveling to other countries other yes. cultures and just you know that's got to be really really cool but what a dream you know uh, I mean, yeah I mean it's Olympics come on no, you know, <laughs> right. what else do you got to say yeah. Yeah, and I think uh, if memory serves me this was the Best showing for the United States in shooting for quite some time, right? If I'm not mistaken, there was like six medals won yeah. by our shooting team. Different events, you know, obviously, yeah. but whatever. But they said, I think it was like the best showing for United States. And I think between you know. Skeet, Bunker, and Air yeah. Rifle, and I can't remember what the other event was. But yeah, yeah. Uh, I think you're right. It's... Well, still, though, man, what an honor for yeah, these that's, people. Yeah, that's really um, cool. And something that you and I will never probably ever experience. No. no we'll never exp- I know we'll never experience it, no. but hats off to the people that are able to. to going to the Olympics and being on the moon, we're just it's just not going to happen. Right. Well, I mean, may not be the Olympics, but you got some news. Um, you got your barrels back from uh, I did. the guys at Rhino, um, so tell us about that a little bit. Okay, so shout out to Corey Cruz. Um, after enough antagonizing. <laughs> <laughs> um, he made you spend money. Uh, yeah. That going, shh, don't tell my wife. She's going to edit these things and I'm oh. going to be in trouble. All right, no, I didn't say nothing. But was... anyway, um, no, a lot of phone calls and text messages with Corey. And he's like, dude, quit messing around. Just do it. And mm-hmm. I'm like, okay. Actual quick backstory. So Eric Roden with Bear Pelt mm-hmm. shoots Kohler Max Life Sporting just like me. And he had taken a lesson with Derek Mine, who at the time was also shooting Kohler, Max Light Sporting. And he said, I should, you know, I put my gun down. Derek's like, here, try this. And he shot the exact same gun, but it was ported by Rhino. And he's like, oh, my God. He said, I immediately sent my gun off. I'm like, really? And he's like, Jason, I'm telling you, don't mess around. Just do it. Well, I know you just got it this earlier this week, so you got a chance to shoot, yeah. right? Tell me all about it. Oh, incredible difference. Um, and I know... <laughs> 
There's been some recent debates online about porting. Always is. This isn't the standard porting. This isn't like what you're going to get on a 725 Browning or something like that. The factory port. It's not the same. It's different. It's they're not drilled. They're oval port. They're I think it's BDM laser, and Jody's going to call me and kick my butt. But I think it's BDM laser porting. They're oval ported. The ports are, are specifically angled at the top of the barrel. It's I'm telling you, it completely eliminates muzzle rise. All right, you're still you're still not telling me the full full facts here. You shot with it. Yes. What do you think? Amazing. Okay, but I absolutely mean absolutely amazing. I, but I mean, on a scale of one to ten, from shooting your gun before when you didn't have porting, right? Now you've got it ported. You went out and shot what a hundred rounds this week? More than that. More than yeah. that. All right, probably so closer to two hundred. Difference being what? Where I can see the most benefit is on you know like a real fast. Uh, true pair style trap targets. Okay. Or maybe it's maybe it's a, a pair of teals, true pair. Okay. The or abil- maybe like a pair of following crossers or something where you got to get right on the second bird immediately type right. of thing. Yeah, that's where you're going to notice the biggest difference because you don't have that muzzle rise and it's like your gun is just steady throughout the whole shot process. I mean, it's... I, 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 I'm. It's I'm, not as an abrupt interruption... Right, so to speak. Yes, that's 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 probably good. Transitioning from one target to the next is a lot easier. The transition, there you go. See, that's Perfect. what I'm. See, this is what I need to know before I send mine down there. You're taking all the words out of my mouth, so you've already thought about it. Just quit screwing Look, around. Look, you know me. I'm an analytical type oh, of guy, and I analyze everything ten times before I do it. <sighs> Just send your crutch sticks down there and I, get them done. I learned that back in carpentry days. You measure twice, you cut once. And you still had to cut it a third time, didn't you? Well, we're not going to talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my god! I, I could tell you stories, but I'm not going to. Do you understand? Does your brain hear what your mouth is saying? Dude, I mean, I, I'm, you know. listen, I'm nothing if not brutally honest. You know what <laughs> yeah. I mean? So take it, take it or leave it. Okay, listen, you're, you're, you're razzling me here. I will tell you right now, <laughs> it made a world of difference transitioning from target a to target b okay let's well, put it that way that, okay that, that alone is enough for me to justify sending them down there i'm telling you sean i wouldn't steer you wrong at least not about shooting do it all right rhino guys you'll be you'll be hearing from me very <laughs> soon oh boy all right hopefully i get commission on this <laughs> anyway um so listen everyone questions for the coaches with don grant actually had to be postponed this week so you're going to hear this the same day that we're recording with don next week so if you hear this please send us those questions if you got any questions for don um mental trainer hypnotist this woman is phenomenal with helping shooters on their mental game if you got a question for him for her excuse me send them in to us yeah well hey man enough messing around i'm waiting to hear from kaylee can we get her on the phone please Talking to me isn't enough. You got to you got to talk to him. When am I ever impatient, man? I want to hear from Kaylee about the Olympics. Uh, I think that's the coolest thing. So, but right after this commercial break, yeah, right. It's all about humanity. It's time to react like never before. For the first time ever, RE Ranger used artificial intelligence to test and optimize one billion different lens variations. It's time to see the sport in a way no one else has with React AI. Available now in frame kits, lens kits, and our most popular lens shapes. For more information, please visit reranger.com. American-made Atlas traps are made right here in Kansas and feature the finest quality, innovation, and support in the business. Atlas traps are made using aircraft-quality aluminum and stainless steel to ensure your traps will outlast the competition. So whether you're an individual needing a private trap for practice and recreation or a club needing to outfit your entire facility, family-owned and operated Atlas traps can suit all your needs. Visit atlastraps.com to see the full line of commercial and recreational traps and accessories. With prices that won't make you see red and quality that won't leave you feeling blue, Atlas has the finest equipment available. All right, Sean, we got her. The Olympic silver medalist, Kaylee Brown. And Kaylee, how are you this evening? 
I'm doing great, y'all. Thanks for having me on. I'm excited. Yeah, it's great to have you. I mean, and, and you're our first Olympic shooter on the show. So. Yes. <laughs> first awesome. Yeah. So we're excited to have you. Well, first Olympian and also first guest that made it on time. Yes. Oh, right. my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> you need to listen. Seriously, you need to bust out a legal pad and write this down with the steps you took and then give them to your boyfriend because he's the worst. Okay. <laughs> uh, like, <laughs> yeah, he's. He's pretty bad. <laughs> yeah, but uh, we love him, though. Yeah, we, we do. I mean, God love David, but he's, oh, boy. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, um, Kaylee, I want to dive right into this. We've got a ton of questions for you. Um, tell us what the journey was like to even make it to the Olympics. I mean, that had to have been crazy, right? Yeah. So the journey didn't just start for me um, at the trials. I mean, this has been a lifelong goal for, oh my gosh, since basically since I found out that shooting was in the Olympics. Um, so a little bit of a background story. I started in sporting clays um, when I was eight years old. I got involved with it from my dad, Tommy Browning. He was a competitive sporting clay shooter and pretty good one at that. So he's taught me pretty much everything I know. Um, and we were actually at a shoot in Missouri, Branson, Missouri. And there was this army recruit there and he was, he was watching this, he was following our whole squad around through the course. And my dad kind of noticed him and he thought, well, you know, I'm, I'm a contender for a shoot off. So maybe he's just watching me. And, and then we went to Kansas and same guy was there and he was following our squad. And my dad noticed that he was watching me. So he approached God and he's like, Hey, why are you following around my 13 year old daughter? And the guy was like, Oh no, no, no. <laughs> the guy was like, Oh no, I'm a, I'm an army recruit. I'm here recruiting people for international bunker trap. And, he was like, well, what, what in the world is international bunker trap? And so, um, you know, he gave us the whole spiel on it and I got invited to a junior Olympic development camp out in Colorado Springs. I was the youngest person to ever attend it there. And, um, for, from there, I was kind of like, you know, this, this is really cool. Um, and learned more about it, found out that I could make world cup teams and travel the world with it. If I, if I made a team. So, um, decided to make the switch over and, and see what that was all about and made my first team when I was 15 years old, uh, wow. traveling team. And I was, <laughs> was the only, uh, kid on the team. And, um, it was a total culture shock to me to go my first overseas trip was to Munich, Germany. It was a total culture shock to me. Um, and just kind of went with it from, from there and, and from there, um, I've made Pan American teams, I've made national teams, set some world records, um, and then now I've made it to the Olympics and and won a medal, which was kind of the whole goal when I started. So, so my journey started <laughs> started a long time ago. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so, okay, back up a second. So you you made the team, right? You made it to the Olympics, and mm-hmm. then the pandemic hits. Now you're yeah. now you're put on hold for years. So that did that like build a bunch of anxiety over the course of the year or were you kind of relieved that you could train a little bit more? How did you tell us what happened the course of the year leading up to actually going to Tokyo? So thankfully our trials concluded and we knew who was on the team right before the pandemic hit. Um, So I had a little bit of security knowing that I was on the team, but I mean, you know, natural reactions when you hear that the Olympics are going to get postponed, it was kind of like, the first we were like, eh, what, what is like this, this virus isn't a big deal. And then it kind of got worse and worse. And then we were like, "Mm, are they actually going to like postpone the Olympics? And then they postponed it. So naturally when the Olympics are postponed, you have all these feelings. You're like, man, I've worked my whole life for this. Now it's, now it's postponed or possibly even canceled. Do I get to keep my spot? You know, there's like a rush of emotions that, that came through with that. But, um, I quickly realized that this was kind of a blessing in disguise um, from a training point of view, because normally you would have the stress of the first half of the trials and training for that. And then if you do well in that, then you have the stress of the six months in between the second half of the trials. And then you have the second half of the trials. And then you have the stress of, if you make that team, then you have the stress of training for the Olympics, which is only about two or three months away from the second half of the trials. So it's just a constant roller coaster of emotions and training and you never really get to step back and and really appreciate what you've accomplished so for me i i was able to kind of take it take a step back and and just breathe and relax and and use that time to my advantage and and get some extra training and almost a whole year of extra training so 
Um, so you, it was a bittersweet thing. <laughs> yeah, so you didn't let that anxiety creep in. You were like, you know what? I'm just going to go out and hammer targets and, and take advantage oh, yeah. of this. Uh, actually. Yeah, once – yeah, once they got postponed, I was like, well, there's, you know, I know that I get to keep my spot and there's nothing I can do about that. So how can I use this to my advantage? So me and my dad sat down and we came up with a whole training plan for that year and, and calculated like the peak performance times and when I needed to be training and when I need to be in the gym and, and nutrition and all this stuff. So yeah. Yeah, that was good. That was actually something I was going to ask you, Kaylee, because, you know, for the people out there that don't understand, I mean, I know you probably have a routine to go to a regular tournament and shoot locally or nationally. How much of a difference is it to try to come up with a regimen to train for the Olympics? I mean, is it night and day? Um, it what it threw me off a little bit um, because you know I was I had planned the whole year around the Olympics being last year, so. Um, then I had to like quickly figure out like, okay, well I'm at my peak performance right now. How do I hold on to that for a year? <laughs> right. Um, so, so that was a little bit stressful, but no, I mean, I've done it for so long. Um, I know my body and I know my routine and I know my mental state going into, uh, things like that. So it's kind of just, you adjust it as needed, but, um, yeah, it's, it's not much different than preparing for, you know, like a, a, a world cup or a nationals or something like that. Okay. Was it just more involved, like more of it all the time kind of thing or the the most hard, the hardest part about it was just figuring out like knowing that I was peaking at that moment or, you know, within a month or so, because that's when the Olympics were, um, or had supposed to be and trying to figure out like, okay, well, how are we going to like advance this to a year to where you, where you peak at the same time this time next year? Um, that was the biggest challenge of, of that, but we were able to work it out. And, and really I took a lot of off time after I found out that it was going to be postponed. I didn't really shoot, um, hardly any shoots at all. I think I shot more sporting clays than anything, um, just for fun and, and really kind of kicked up my training about seven months out. Gotcha. What about the anxiety angle of it? I mean, did it really, you know, obviously, you had to be heartbroken because everything just kind of hit the brakes. I mean, we, we experienced the mm-hmm. same thing here. We, we saw things, you know, venues closing, uh, closing, sporting events closing, and you know, everybody saw it. Everybody didn't realize what, how bad this thing was going to get. I mean, did it really mentally, how did you, how did you handle all that? For me, it really wasn't too bad. I didn't feel too anxious about it being postponed. And I think the reason being is because, um, I have my own training facility here out in Arkansas. So okay. I, it would have been a totally different ball game if I was out at Colorado Springs or somewhere that I didn't have a place to train for that long, then I could totally see where, you know, anxiety, would be. you might just completely freak out because you don't have right. training, you know, you're relying on somebody else to go train. So, um, I think that that is really kind of what helped me it was like kind of therapy. It kind of <laughs> helped keep me calm because when I felt the need to go train or even if it was like kind of outside of my schedule and anxiety was creeping in, I could just go outside <laughs> and train. So that, that helped a lot. Well, you know, not just anxiety, but we had a talk with David while you were in Tokyo. Um, he actually came on the show and we were talking about pressure and David seemed to think that you really thrived under those conditions. What, what, what's your take on that, Kelly? Would you agree with that? Um, yeah, I, I would say I performed pretty well under pressure, especially when I know that something's on the line and I have to give credit to my dad for installing that in me because we used to bet all the time and it could be the littlest thing like a snow cone or a ice cream or a dollar. But if there was something on the line, like pressure on the line, I just was not going to lose it. <laughs> and, right. Um, so I, I've always kind of been that way and just kind of learned that. So whenever those pressure situations arise, um, I don't freak out. I don't feel anxiety on those. And it's just a mental state that I can kind of turn on. Um, and I feel that I, I almost perform better in those situations than I would just like walking out and, and then just shooting a normal shoot. You know, it's, it's funny because, and this is, Oh my gosh, this is nowhere near comparable to what you've done. Um, but just for something silly, Sean and I made a personal bet on a make or break for the, uh, it was the SCTP um, shoot, the Nationals. And they had a make or break set up, and we were there. And I was like, you know what, I'll bet you that, you know, whatever, I can beat you on the make or break. And we ended up donating it to kids and clay. So it was for a good cause. But 
I was so nervous walking up there. And Sean was just calm, cool, and collect and just killed me. Well, we had a rematch <laughs> for double or nothing. And we're being filmed. And, of course, Chad Roberts is behind us. And he's chanting all kind of stuff and filming it. And Sean was visibly shaking the whole time we did that. <laughs> and it looked like he was all of a sudden oh, an I, E-class shooter. I was definitely off my game. <laughs> I was definitely off my game. <laughs> so it's funny how people handle pressure. And it's funny what you're saying about, you know, you and your dad, even if it's just a bet for a snow clone, it's a bet, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I think yeah. David said it best. He's like, you know, being on the line for a world championship isn't pressure. Pressure is betting your buddy 50 bucks and you only got $5 in your pocket, right? So yeah, Exactly, and yeah. That, and it's funny. So that's that's kind of hilarious how you, you learned to handle pressure with just the bets with your dad. That's really cool, actually. Yeah, so I was taught from a really young age, you know, I mean, the only thing that causes anxiety is those fear-based thoughts, right? Like, oh my gosh, I hope that I can hit this or I... I hope I don't miss or whatever those fear-based thoughts are. That's what causes the anxiety. Whenever I get into a situation like that, I just know what I have to do. And I know that I have years of train training to, you know, back that up with. And, and really there's no reason to put unnecessary pressure on myself. So when that task is at hand, I just focus on that task and, and that's it. I just, I've, I've worked really hard over the years mentally being able to control those thoughts that I have in those situations. Um, because just like Sean, when he was on the make or break, he probably was, was nervous because he was like, Oh man, I, I hope I don't lose. Or I wonder what this guy's going to shoot. Or I hope I can hit that number seven. You right, know, yeah. right, those, right. Those future, those future thoughts that you're looking into on something that hasn't even happened yet. And it's causing you all these physical reactions. So um, I've spent a lot of time learning how to control those thoughts and control your, your emotions on, on those situations. And, uh, it's, it's been really, really helpful a lot of the time well, on the biggest platform of my life. I, I mean, going into the finals, I knew that in my qualification rounds, that last round, I knew I could not miss a target. And if I sat there and, and thought, oh my gosh, I'm at the Olympics and I cannot miss one single target on this last round or else I'm not going to make a final it'd been game over. Yeah. yeah, I would have crashed. Well, and I think that's something that everybody can relate to because as shooters, as you go up through the sport and you start you know, competing in, in tournaments, that's one of the things you have to deal with. Yeah, not only do you have to be a good shooter and you have to practice and, and you know learn the, the basic chops and so on and so forth to, to shoot sporting clays or, or, or trap or whatever, then you're dealing with the competition and you're dealing with the nerves, you're dealing with the pressure, you're dealing with everything else involved that gets into your mind while you're shooting, and that is such a huge trigger for most people. I mean – Eventually, you you learn kind of how to deal with it, but for a while there, it can definitely paralyze you. So, yeah, it definitely can, and and that's a big question that I get from a lot of my students is, you know, they're like, "What's the secret? What's the key?" Mentally, <laughs> I'm just like, that takes for as much physical practice as you put in the game, you have to do the same mentally. I mean, it will not come to you overnight. Right. Right. Well, you just got to stay in the saddle, I guess, and keep riding, right? <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so let's let's talk about getting to Tokyo. I mean, that's you've never been there before, right? No, I've only ever flown through the airport. Okay. So I don't really count that. <laughs> so I mean, let's talk a little bit about the actual experience there. I mean, you know, let's let's dive into like the actual interaction. Did you get to meet you know other shooters from other countries? Did you form any friendships? Did you talk about? you know, shooting or guns or anything with, with any of the other competitors or how was that like for you? Oh, for sure. Well, the cool thing is, is most of the competitors that were at the Olympics are kind of like the same circle that go to all of the world cups and, okay. and, uh, world cup finals and stuff. So I knew, I, I knew all of the shooters and, and good friends with them, but what the coolest part was is in the village, USA had our own building. So that was designated to all of the athletes, not just like shooters so like on our floor we had some um, basketball teams we had gymnasts we had swimmers we had track runners we had so many um different athletes in, in different sports in the building so every day you know you get on the elevator you'd share an elevator with you know, like Kevin Durant <laughs> or, or <laughs> um <laughs> yeah or um you know some some Katie Ledecky or whoever and it's like all these famous names and you're just like oh my gosh like I'm staying in the same building as all of these <laughs> famous people. That's so cool. Um, so it was, it was really cool to, we got to be good friends with like the water polo team and baseball team. So um, meeting all those, all those different athletes 
and then getting to watch them on TV and then seeing them that night in the cafeteria at dinner. We're like, Hey, that was so cool to watch you. Cause we kind of had like somebody to cheer for it. We felt like we knew them. Yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. So as far as the shooting goes, I mean, you pretty much knew the people you were going to be competing against for the most part. And you'd already kind of probably talked to them or you knew what they were all about at that point. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Gotcha. So I got a funny question. Is it true that you really slept on a cardboard bed? Oh, unfortunately, they were terrible. <laughs> I don't. All right, we got to hear I about this. Oh my gosh, I literally could have like unboxed the thing and probably fit it in my suitcase. It was awful. Um, <laughs> so the first, the first night we got in there, we were like, uh, "Is this for real? Like <laughs> these are beds?" And to make it even worse, like the mattress was made of like this. Um, You know what, like, those nylon sponges are made out of? It was, like, those hard plastic ones. That's, like, what the mattress is made out of. So so we we got our coach down there, and we were like, look, uh, we found these mattress toppers on Amazon for 45 bucks. Like, we just ordered two or three, and so he was like, yeah, that's fine. So we uh, overnighted mattress toppers for for all of our beds, and then it wasn't too bad, but. Yeah, the first night was. Well, if you, if you can't sleep, I mean, it's hard to perform, right? Come on. Right. Oh my, yeah. I mean, I was like, really? This is we're at the freaking Olympics, and we're going to sleep on a cardboard bed? <laughs> okay. <Yeah. laughs> well, you know, speak speaking of that for a second. You know, we talk a little bit about that here in the states, like traveling to a shoot. Um, you know, you're you're not sleeping in your own bed. You're you're not eating the food that you're used to. Um, you're not in the environment or at the club that you're used to. So. We talk about these battles back here at home um, when we go to a big shoot or something across country. You went halfway across the world. What's it like competing in an environment like that? It's, you know, I can imagine that outside of the USA, you know, area, it's there's probably a language barrier. There's a million things, right? I mean, tell us what it's like to mm-hmm. compete in an environment like that. So... It was definitely, I've, you know, I've never been to Japan. Um, so it was definitely a little bit odd compared to some of the other countries I've been to. It was an extremely clean country. I will say that, um, very clean country, but yeah, the, the time difference, the different food, um, you know, being in an apartment on a cardboard bed, (laughs) it was definitely, definitely a little bit out of the ordinary most of the time when we go to a different country you know i mean you kind of know what to expect like when you go to italy you can expect pretty good food and and good accommodations and then um but i will say japan made it pretty pretty good for i would say like culturally for everybody food wise um they probably had oh i don't know 15 different little countries set up like they had a usa station that had like hamburgers or pizza um, they had like a sushi station, they had pasta station. So really, I feel like um, inside the village, they made it the best they could, like accommodations for each country that was there. So we kind of felt at home. But the, I would say the time difference is is the hardest part to get over. I mean, I, I can find something to eat anywhere. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not <laughs> that picky. Um, so so really just the bed, the sleeping arrangements and the time difference was, was the most challenging part over there. You know, everything else you could kind of, you could, you kind of had your hands, you could get to, um, if you needed it, but yeah, those were, those were the two things that made it a little bit more difficult, but thankfully we had plenty of time to kind of get adjusted to the time and get adjusted to food that we liked and, and get our sleeping arrangements figured out. Gotcha. Well, other, other than, you know, the, the, the bed and stuff, was there any other major curveballs or shocks that you just kind of, kind of weren't ready for, or maybe weren't prepared for, or didn't even think you were going to have to face while you were there? So a tsunami came through. <laughs> Holy cow. And, really? Yeah. Yeah. So we were, uh, me and one of my, my teammates, Brian Burroughs, we were on our way to catch the bus to head out to the range And we were looking at the weather and we were, so our bus, they had like 30 different buses that would take all the athletes to the different venues. So like gymnastics had a bus, swimming had a bus, you know, we all had a bus. Um, And our bus was right next to the surfers. So Brad and I were sitting there one day and we're like checking the weather, what it's going to be like for the competition. And day one on competition, there's supposed to be a tsunami hit. And we're sitting there looking at it and we're like, oh my gosh, like a tsunami is going to hit on 
whatever day it was that we can see like the 28th and the surfers heard that and they were like what a tsunami's coming in you know me and brian were all bummed out and the surfers were like yeah tsunami's coming in they were gonna have like some massive waves to catch and we were like oh my gosh a tsunami so um that that was a little bit challenging on day one luckily it kind of passed us a little bit but we we caught some of the rain and the wind from that and even on the second day the finals day um i don't know if you can really see it in in the finals or if y'all have watched the finals, but it was, it was pretty windy. It was like yeah. 25 plus mile, or, mile an hour wind that day. And it was from that, from that tsunami that was coming through. So. Right. Right. Yeah. The flags were getting it. Um, I saw mm-hmm. that on the videos. So, okay, Kaylee, <laughs> anytime any of us compete and we have a win, I don't care if, you know, a guy's in E class and he gets his first class win. Once that first win comes, you want more and more, okay? It, it's just it's just natural. It's how it is. We all want more. Anybody that's competitive, once they win, they want to keep winning. Now that you have competed on the absolute pinnacle of your sport, do you still want more? Um, I mean, you know, it's natural to want to continue to better yourself. You know, I shot a 120 out of 125, and there's obviously room for improvement there. And, you know, I look back and I got a silver medal, but you could obviously still get gold. Um, so that's a tricky question. I don't know if more is the right word for that, but I definitely think if I were to try it again, I would probably want to beat my silver. I would want to come home okay. with a gold. That's, okay. that's, yeah. that's where we were heading. <laughs> that's where we were heading. Yeah. Are, yeah. We, are we going to see Kaylee Browning in 2024? <laughs> probably so. All right. Nice. Nice. Can, can I – listen, Kaylee, I'm, I'm nowhere near the shooter that you are, and I'm not going to pretend to be. But I will tell you this. As somebody that's 48 years old, married, has a family, you know, you don't have that yet. Um, you will. But I, I know your dad and everybody else is giving you advice. So if I can give you one piece of advice, listen, you're young, you don't have kids, you're not married, you've got the ultimate training facility right there at Cyprus. Follow your dream, go for it. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. Really, I, yep. I mean, honestly, listen, we are all very, very proud of you, Kaylee. Yeah, absolutely. You made the Olympics, and not only did you make the Olympics, you medaled in the Olympics. We are extremely proud of you. We're extremely humbled and honored that you joined us tonight, by the way. But if you want to do it again, you got the support of the whole country behind you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. That's, that that's high praise from Jason Rambo. I tell you that what. Is, that's, that's, man, I tell hey, you. Hey, it doesn't come very often. I, and don't tell David <laughs> I said it. Yeah, because I never get nothing like that on the show. I'm usually getting thrown <laughs> under the bus every other every other question. So, <laughs> but but no, I, I'm I'm I mean that wholeheartedly, Kaylee. I mean, follow your dreams. You you have right now. You've accomplished what only a very very few ever have. And if you think you can do it again. Go for it, girl. Just go ahead and let it rip. Yeah. So yeah, thank no you. I appreciate it. Hey, I got a dumb question, Kaylee. So okay. I know most that, of his questions usually are Kaylee. So bear with me. You see what I you see what I deal with, Kaylee. You see what I, I deal see, with. Yeah, I see. Yeah. Ask David. He's been here. Um, so I got a really dumb question. So obviously you've got shooters coming from all over the world, and the question I had, and I've, I've actually talked to a couple other people that were curious about this. What do they do? in regards to the shells you're shooting, do they like cut them apart and test them before you compete or after you compete? I'm really curious as to like what steps they go through when you guys are shooting to keep everything fair. Yeah. Um, that's a good, that's not a dumb question at all. That's a really good question. Um, so we do have regulated ammunition and anything, um, that we bring in, or even if it's bought there, um, they will randomly come and test every athlete shells. Okay. Uh, so they'll take them, they'll take them during the competition and like, um, before even before the competition and yeah they they cut them open they weigh the shots they size the shots they make sure that everything's regulated um and then they do that as well right before the finals too so with all of the finalists they they go through the ammo check again just to make sure that um you know nobody's sneaking in a hotter load than should be um and fun fact even if i've i've gotten actually this i've gotten yellow carded for this before so we were in um italy last year and we bought shells at the range, like the the range supplied the shells, and they were hot shells. They were they we could they were illegal shells, and I got caught with them. Not I mean we didn't know that on the box it said you know everything that was supposed to say seven and a half twenty four gram, but they weighed too heavy, and 
um, I, I got yellow carded and had to, had to get all my shells kicked out and then had to, we had to like run around Italy and trying to find legal shells the next night and it was a mess. So, but yeah, even, even if you buy them from the range itself, like what the range is selling you, they'll, they can, you know, it doesn't matter even if you bought them there. So. Well, which leads to my next qu- next question. So did you actually see anybody or hear of anybody having a problem like that while they were shooting at the Olympics? Uh, no, I don't think any, I don't think anybody did. Um, if they did, I, I didn't hear about it, but I don't, I think everybody was, was pretty clean. Okay. I'm, I'm impressed. I'm impressed. You gotta watch the French. You gotta watch the French. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yep. They'll, they'll sneak them in there. Oh boy. Oh boy. No, I was just getting ready to say, I'm impressed, Sean. It wasn't a dumb question. That was a very good question. Yeah, that was a very good question. I, um, you Man, know what? Two compliments in one show, Jason. Wow, I need to. Mar- <laughs> That's enough. I need to buy That's a lottery enough. ticket, and you know oh. what? Shut his microphone off. You're done. <laughs> <laughs> tonight, tonight's your night. Yeah, yeah. I but guess you know so. what, Sean? I'm impressed enough. I'm going to let you ask Kaylee the rapid fire questions. Oh, cool. Oh, so oh I'm, I'm going to give you the throne for this evening. Sweet. Uh, well, Kaylee, you, I, I, I assume you've heard our rapid fire segments that we ask a lot of the shooters. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. So are you ready? I think so. All right. <laughs> Let's start with the gun. What gun do you shoot? <laughs> I shoot a Craig off K80 12 gauge. And what's the barrel length? 32s. Okay. Uh, screw in chokes or fixed chokes? Screw in chokes. Okay. Uh, custom stock or factory stock? Custom stock. Also made by Craig off. Okay. Cool deal. And then what's your go-to shells? Uh, Federals. They shoot 24 grams, seven and a half. Seven and a half. Okay. Gotcha. And are you a vest or a shell bag shooter? I'm a vest person. Any particular brand? I like Bear Pelt. Nice. Yes. Nice. Hey, hey wait a <laughs> the minute. Bear Pelt girl. Is this, wait a minute. Now, hold on a minute. I've got to stop. Hold, sorry, Sean. I don't mean to interrupt. Kaylee, is this an official announcement? Can you make that? I cannot confirm nor deny quite yet. However, <laughs> man. <laughs> however, okay. I did. I did wear it in the Olympics. They went through and they made a whole custom vest for me, which was awesome. Um, so yeah, sweet. sweet, awesome. Okay, let's get back on track here. Uh, how about glasses? Peeless. And then finally, your ear protection. I shoot ESPs. Nice. Thank you, Kaylee. This is. <laughs> Aside from, you know, the stuff that my partner's coming up with over here, this has been awesome. I really, really appreciate you spending some time with this. I'm sure there's people you want to thank along the way. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So first and foremost, I have to thank my parents, especially my dad, because he has been my coach my entire life. Um, he's, he's really the one that's taught me everything and helped me figure out everything and kind of navigate through everything. So um, would not be here without him. Um, my community has come together. You would not believe how many, like my whole com- community, the town I'm from threw me a huge going away parade, um, before the Olympics and businesses wrote, you know, on their mirrors and ha- had banners out there. And, you know, like the big electronic billboard signs had my face on it that said, go for gold. And, all this stuff. And then when I came home, you know, everybody showed up at the airport. David was there. All my friends were there. My family was there. The news was there. That was cool. (laughs) That was very cool. Yeah. Yeah. Stepped off the plane and, you know, the whole town's there. And and even like the Arkansas fire department and state police and all of them, we got escorted. I mean, it was a whole thing. So if I could, if I could think anybody, you know, it'd be family, friends, and then my my community because they have went above and beyond to show support in any any way that they can. I mean, it, it has been awesome. That's that's very very cool. Listen, you may have silver, but you're gold in our hearts. We we we're very <laughs> proud of you. Yeah, I mean, what an I accomplishment. Was, I was on a I was on you know as soon as I knew that I had a medal, I truly did not care what color it was. I was just like, oh my gosh, I just medaled at the Olympics. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, what an achievement. I mean, I. I I can't even begin to imagine, Kaylee. We're we're super proud of you. I'm sure you're probably still floating on a cloud of some sort right now. You know, I mean, it's it has it officially sunk in. I mean, you've been home long enough. Has it really sunk into what you've done? Um, it's kind of starting to. Um, it's still there's still like a high from it though. You know, all the news is calling and and interviews and stuff. So it's still kind of like I'm still in that. 
um, mindset of like it just happening. And even though it did just happen, but um, it, it's, I really haven't come off that like and, cloud and, nine yet about it. And now you got these two jerkies over here on the dead prayer podcast calling you. <laughs> hey, no, it's, it's awesome. <laughs> Well, we got a lot of fans that wanted to hear from you. And again, thank you so much for taking time yes. out of your busy schedule to come and visit with us. We really love it. And Jason and I are really looking forward to the time when we can both get down there to Arkansas and visit you and David at the facility, maybe sit down. and. Oh, it's coming. I'm not waiting on you any longer. What do you mean oh, waiting yeah, on yeah. me? I'm not waiting on you any longer. No, listen. <laughs> no, I saw, Hey, Kaylee, I don't know if David told you this or not. I met Joel Dondas at the Ohio State shoot. Oh, did you? What a super, super nice gentleman. Joel, we if you're love listening. Joel. Yeah. And I told we him. We love Joel. I told him that uh, I was trying to get down there to see you and David and, you know, Sean and I and trying to figure out schedules and work and everything. And he said, I, and I was te- telling him that I had teased David that I'm not going to be eating Hot Pockets and macaroni and cheese. I wanted Joel there. Oh, no, no, no. Yeah. Joel. <laughs> Joel. Joel will never allow hot pockets. <laughs> right. So Joel spoke up and he said, you know what? I'm always looking for an excuse to go down there. You let me know when you're going to be down there. I'll go down there with you guys. I'll cook for you. And, I'm, yeah. and I he's told actually, David, and he's like, are you serious? And I'm like, dude, it's on. I don't want your hot pockets. Joel's cooking for us. Yeah, we're already frothing oh, yeah. at the mouth over here. <laughs> yeah. We love when Joel comes to see us because he's always he always brings all the good food from New Orleans. So we he brings like fresh seafood and fresh crawfish and all this kind of stuff to cook for us. And he makes the meanest. So he's gonna kill me for this because I don't remember what it's called, but it's like a crawfish etouffee. So yeah, 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 yeah exactly. etouffee. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. So he makes an awesome one of those, and he brings this rice that's like popcorn rice. And he like specifically puts the rice on one side of the bowl and then he'll put the crawfish on the other side. And he's like, you cannot mix it. You have to like scoop it and bite it. And every time, every time he comes down here, I'm like, Joel, it's so much better if you mix it all together. And he gets so (laughs) mad at me. I'm just over there like, I'm over there like mixing it all together. He just rolls his eyes. I, I lived in Texas for five years and I went to Louisiana every chance I got because the casinos and, the crawfish etouffee and the boudin, and I mean, I can go on and on mm-hmm. and on. And I absolutely fell in love with that kind of. This is again why I'm forty pounds heavier than I used to be, but um, <laughs> <laughs> I absolutely fell in love with that type of cooking. And then when you guys had Joel on y'all show, I was like, oh yeah, if I'm going oh, down yeah. there, Joel's <laughs> gonna be there. Yeah, we apologize to our listeners right now. If you're hearing any weird noises, that's me and Jason's stomach rumbling right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah. you know what? Though, no, actually. Joel's Joel's coming down here in the next two or three weeks, I think. He's coming down sometime in September. Don't so you dare to... tease me, Kaylee. Don't you dare. Don't. <laughs> uh, is it too late to book a I'm flight, just saying, Jason? You, you follow our follow our social media. You'll be seeing some of the food he's cooking. Oh, well, wow. I listen. Aside from the food, he was a super super gentleman. Look forward to spending some time. Hopefully, we get to shoot together too. I mean, what a nice yeah. guy. So you guys have got something there with that guy for sure. Yeah, but be a lot of fun, um, Kaylee. We're going to run. we got some more stuff to do yet here on the show, but thank you again from the bottom of our hearts. We really appreciate yeah, you. Absolutely an honor and a privilege. Thank yes. you, Kaylee. Yeah, thank you all so much for having me on. We'll have to do it again. Absolutely. Anytime you want, come come visit. Sounds good. Leave, leave David Sounds at home. Good. <laughs> yep, we'll <laughs> do. Thanks, Kaylee. Thanks, Kaylee. Have a good night. All right, talk to you later. Uh-huh, bye-bye. Wow. Right? I mean, Kaylee how, Browning. How cool was that, man? Yes, that was awesome. Absolutely, and she can no longer say, "Hey, my boyfriend's a world champion," because all she's got to do is dangle the medal in front of his face. I'm and an go, Olympic I'm medal an Olympic winner. Medalist, yeah. you can take your world championship and stuff it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I'm sure that conversation's probably yeah, happened more than one time since she's been back. Oh so. man, but you know what? God bless that girl. I mean, seriously, that's so awesome. Yeah. So proud of her. Um, I hope she does it again. I hope she goes back to the Olympics. I want to see her try for a gold. Even if she doesn't succeed, I think she should follow her dream. Yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I think she's got a lot to do to, to add to the sport and she's no she's young enough, it's like she could go for a long time before she really needed yeah. to, to slow down. Shifting gears for a second. Mm-hmm. You know, Sean, I got a lot of good ideas. Trouble is most of them suck. <laughs> So, I was having a conversation with Eric Roden mm-hmm. from Bear Pelt. Mm-hmm. We're looking at new ideas, right, for Bear Pelt. And I said, hey, 
what if we did something special once a month and we're going to pull a random shooter that has bought a bear pelt vest. We're going to call him up and do a little segment, little, little shooter profile and a little, you know, background on why they chose the vest, that kind of thing. And he's like, you know what? Heck yeah, that's a cool idea. So what do you think about that, Sean? Well, as I told you the last time I heard this, you're you're good for a good i uh, you're you're good for a great idea every once in a blue moon. So the blue the moon was blue, and here we are. The moon's always blue. <laughs> <laughs> now that's why we keep you around, Jason. You got some good ideas once in a while. So right, yeah. and I think it'd be cool. It'll showcase the shooter and the vest. Thank you very much to Bear Pelt for coming on board with us and being part of this program. Uh, we love what you're doing. We love the innovation. Uh, they never stop. It's not just us either. I mean, every shoot we go to, we see more and more and more people wearing bear pelt vests. I think the product speaks for itself. Yeah, no, I mean, once you try it on and you go out and shoot with it, you're like, holy cow, where's this been? You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, seriously, right? seriously. Yeah, and it's so, like a new pair of shoes. Yeah, so. It is, it is. But hey, our shooter is Bruce Porter, and he's waiting on us to call. Let's give Bruce a call. We'll ring him up. All right, on the phone with us, we got Bruce Potter. This segment is brought to you by Bear Pelt. At Bear Pelt, it's not just your vest, it's your new uniform. Bruce, how are you this evening? I'm doing wonderful. How about you guys? Uh, we're doing really good. Just got off the phone with Kaylee Browning. Uh, she had awesome stuff to say about the, uh, the Olympics over there in Tokyo, winning the silver medal. Uh, everybody will have a great time listening to that interview. And she was wearing a bear pelt and vest. And she was wearing a bear pelt vest, so That's it goes, right. goes hand in hand. Awesome. <laughs> Exciting stuff. Yes. No doubt. For sure. No doubt. Bruce, tell us who you are and where you're from. Well, as you have already mentioned, my name is Bruce Potter. Um, I'm a master class sporting clay shooter. I live in Florida. I am the general manager at Blackjack Sporting Clays. And, uh, oh, nice. I'm just, a, I'm, I'm just a laid back, casual, normal kind of guy that, that absolutely loves sporting clays. Okay. How often do you compete, Bruce? Um, just about every weekend. Okay, cool. And you travel yeah. all over Florida or do you go outside yep, of Florida? Yep. Well, I haven't, I haven't gone outside of Florida in a while because of, of uh, obligations and work and, I don't know if you've ever worked at a sporting place course. If you if you love to shoot, that's probably the last place you want to work. Yeah, um, yeah. Then, then it really does feel like work at that point, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It becomes work, but if you love it enough, you overcome that. I just like being around the people, being around the sport, the industry. Um, it's just it's always been a passion of mine, and it, it, it's really not work. Gotcha. What are what are some of your favorite courses that you go to get to shoot at? Oh, well, one of my favorite courses is Vero Beach. Yeah. Um, I, I really like uh, Brian Palmer. He's a, he's a stand up guy and he throws really good targets. Um, I like all the clubs in Florida, but I'm, you know, rather than having bells and whistles, I want good targets. Yeah. No but, doubt. No doubt. Yeah. 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 And, and they all do it. They'd all do a really good job. They work really hard. Um, we've got some of the, the greatest people at the clubs here in Florida. So it's a great, great destination to come to. Yeah. It's a great state. A lot of clubs down there. I've, I've personally got to shoot at two or three. I've shot at uh, Quail Creek. I've shot at, uh, Gulf Coast Clays. I'm trying to think. Was there something? Okay Corral? What? Okay right. Corral. Okay Corral. Yeah. Shot yep. at Okay Corral. Yep. Um, yeah. A lot of great places, but I still have a lot of other places too. Yep. South, to South Florida shooting clubs are a really good place. And, you know, we've got some really good target setters here in Florida. Yeah, no um, doubt. We've got, we've got guys that have been setting targets for years. And, and, you know, over the years, I've, I've kind of grown to, to like some target setters. I like their style and the way they do. Um, mm -hmm. you, you guys know Mick House. And yeah, yeah. I just, I just love his targets. I yeah. mean, they're just, I, I drive, you know, from one end of the state to the other to shoot his targets. So they're, nice. just, they're just good. Yep. Nice. Well, let's get down to the nitty gritty. Um, so what influenced you to buy a bear pelt vest? Well, I'll be totally honest with you. Um, with my, with my last job change and I, and I went to, uh, work at black check sporting clays and became the general manager. Um, my, my vest had logos and stuff on it that I just didn't want on there anymore. And I wanted to prom promote the club. So I started looking for a new vest with the, with our logos on it. And, uh, I had previously bought some vests from some other companies and just wasn't satisfied with the vest that, you know, the, the quality wasn't there. They were, they were extremely hot. They were uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I, I, I really, what I, what I was looking for in the beginning was looks, just total looks. And, when I saw that the they did that that uh, dye sublimation on those vests, I thought, well, that's the way to go, and that's really going to stand out and be sharp. So I'll be totally honest. I, I ordered it just for the looks. And uh, when I got the vest and, and looked it over and saw how it was made and, you know, the, the zippers were covered and, 
and you know all this all the stitching was super strong and i thought wow this thing is really well made and um i was extremely happy with it but but i tell you what when i wore it and i started to shoot in this 100 plus degree weather down here and i realized how cool it was man i was so yeah it was it was amazing uh, and you know there's there's you know i could keep you on the phone half the night telling you all the good <laughs> points about it <laughs> but the greatest thing to me was was the comfort um you know it it looks fantastic it's comfortable and of course the price i mean I, i'll be honest with you um I, i'm probably their best customer in florida I, I mean i liked it so well i i ordered the competition vest and i turned around and, <laughs> and i ordered the uh the lighter weight one yep yep and after i ordered that i found out that they make it in uh, yellow which is my favorite color now you know I, I like yellow so much my my 391 used to be painted yellow oh wow, so <laughs> sweet i called her back and i said well you know i gotta have one of these so so I guess I'm the proud owner of three bear pelt vests. <laughs> okay, so, so how long since you've owned the first one? How long has it been? Oh, it's been probably two months. Two months. Okay. And yep. you said your favorite feature was the fit, right? The comfort? Oh, oh the fit. Well, you, first you gotta understand I'm I'm almost just shy of six foot five inches tall. Oh wow. No, he's like he's and, a brother from yeah, another mother. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And I'm I'm two hundred and sixty five pounds. I'm a I'm a big guy. And you know, the other vests that I've had in the last 20 years, I've had to have custom made. Mm -hmm. Right. And I was really scared when I ordered this one around because I just went through it with another vest company. I ordered three vests, got all three of them. They had to be returned each time because even, even with the measurements, they were still wrong. So, uh, Heather spent the time with me on the phone and, and, uh, she told me what she thought would work and she went ahead and, and, and did it and sent it to me, which they even have them in, in tall sizes. So right. I got the vest and I put it on and I was just like, couldn't believe how well it fit. Now they, you know, they're, they're the way they're made, they fit a little bit tighter in the chest mm -hmm. and then they're a little bit looser at the, at the bottom end of the vest, which right. allows you a lot of comfort. And, you know, just the design of the shell pockets actually stay closed at the top. So, I mean, you can easily put your hand in it, but with the other vest, if you've been over to pick some up, all your shells fall on the ground. Oh yeah. Or um, if you take well, it off and yeah. throw it in the back of your buggy, they go rolling around. Right. Too. And they'll fall out. Well, well this thing, well, I put it on today. I didn't realize it, but last weekend I had both pockets full of empties <laughs> and uh, threw, it, threw it in the back of the truck, put it on the clay's car that rode out to the course. And I went to, I went to shoot some targets. I said today and threw the vest on. I thought, well, cool. I got, I got shells in here, but they were all empty. <laughs> <laughs> so let me, I'm going to put you on the spot here for a second. Go ahead. I like that. What would you say to someone that's on the fence about trying a bear pelt vest? What would you say to them to get them to buy the vest? What would I say? Well, what do you have to lose? I mean, look at look at the price of the vest. I mean, right? It, 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 you've got you've got all these people that are telling you to buy it. You know, listen. First of all, we got to realize some people are just cheap. They've got money in their pocket. <laughs> yep. and they just don't want to spend it. Yep, you they're can't out do there. A whole lot with a person like that. Right. But uh, you know, if you're if you're if you're, listen for me, and I can't speak for up north because I live in the south. Well, well, down here it's hot. Right. And if you're you're tired of sweating in a vest you need to try one. I mean, that's the, that's the whole deal. It's, it's quality made. It's cool. And, and the price is, like I say, it's so cheap. You can afford two of them. Right. Yeah. That's so, what me and Jason um, have, have discovered. You too. know, right. And, and I guess they've changed the name of it. It used to be a competition vest and a practice vest. Now I saw the other day that I think they're calling it a, um, a, a light, light competition or, or something like that, which I think was a good idea because the vest quality for both vests is the same. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. It's absolutely. just the, the design, the way they're made, you know, Yep. Yeah. Um, it, it lets the air through the other one. So yep. that's, so, that's the problem I would have. I wouldn't know. I wouldn't know what to tell people which one to get. Yeah. So, but, but I really, I be honest with you, I really steer towards the competition vest for myself. When I put the vest on, I feel like, I feel like Superman. <laughs> uh, I, I put it on and it's my superhero. They, cave right. it, because it, they you know, I feel, feel comfortable. I, when I put it on, I'm no longer scared of that, that 70 yard teal. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Well, you know, it, <laughs> I think the price point's one hundred and thirty dollars. I think one hundred thirty something. Yeah. yeah, I mean, at that price point, how could you not afford to get one of each? Right, that, that's what I mean. I mean, you know unless I mean? you're just unless you're just cheap, and right. you get the option to and, completely customize the dag on thing and, any and, way you like. And, right, and I know I, I know I shouldn't talk about other shooters, and if you want to know who I'm talking about, you just go back in your history of your podcast and you'll figure it out. <laughs> but 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 the really the really cheap shooters the really cheap shooters they they will shoot with a nail apron. <laughs> sure. So, yeah. Uh, I bet I get a, I bet I get a phone call now. 
haven't uh, talked to him two, I haven't talked to him in two years, but I bet he calls them. No, man, that's <laughs> funny. Anyway, well, yeah. well, Bruce, listen, um, you know, I was down there last year for the Florida yeah. State shoot, and how much I really love blackjack. And uh, right. you know, you, you told me before we went on this phone call that uh, you know you're a regular listener of the show, so you know my wife and I are looking at a place down there, so. Right. We'll, we'll be neighbors soon, and I'll be driving you nuts because I'll be there at Blackjack as much as I can. So. Oh, he will, too. Well, that's fantastic. <laughs> yeah. That's fantastic. Absolutely. Well, you know, that's, that, that's the other half. I mean, I told you how much I love sporting plays, but I also love people. And, uh, you know, being at the club, and, and not only are they just people, but they're, they're friends. They're like-minded people. They're, they're shooters. Right. You know, they're people that want to come and, and enjoy the sport and have a good time. So, listen, even if the two of y'all can't get along, y'all can still both come. <laughs> listen we've, we've got we've got three huge courses so i can put you on a different course every day so that, no that sounds just, good that sounds good well the thing here's what's going to happen is i know where the back 40 of that place is like where y'all had the fee task for the state last year yes yes and i'm going to run sean out there drop him off tell him i'll be right back and i'm going to go up front and shoot the five ten underneath that great big oak tree uh and i think that's an oak tree <laughs> i think it's huge yeah, yeah oh yeah, my goodness yeah. Listen, I'm not sure which one you're talking about. We got a bunch of big trees. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm talking about the one at the five stand. Oh, okay. The one at the five stand. Well, actually, the five stand is built around that oak tree. Yes, I think it comes right up to the center of it. That thing's probably, I, I bet it's 500 years old. But you it's know what? A big old tree. To go back to what you said, it, it's just not that you love sporting clothes, it's that you love people. And the right. two people that are involved with bear pelt vests is what makes that vest so special. Eric and well, Heather Roden are great, great people. They they really put their heart and soul into it. Well, the little bit of time that I've known them, I haven't known them very long. You know, just just through buying the vest. Right. And uh, and I tell you what, it's it's refreshing. Number one, the vest is made here. Number two, that if if you have a question and you call, you don't talk to a computer or a machine. You talk to a person. Right. Right. And the and and the person that you talk to is vested. In other words, their interest they have an interest in the company because it's theirs. Right. And, uh, and you're right. I mean, she. I haven't talked to him much, but I'm gonna tell you, she's a go getter. She's a worker. Oh yeah, oh, man. And, oh, uh, yeah. yeah. The only, the only, only you know thing we've talked about him was that you know she needs to let him stick around for a while because I'm sure he's good for something. <laughs> but, <laughs> <laughs> oh, this this wow. podcast just took a turn. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna we're gonna get yeah. calls now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> There goes the second phone call I'm going to get. <laughs> right. They they were both in studio, and to say the least, that her hand was cocked and ready to go at any moment if he said anything out of line. <laughs> but no, they're they're both wonderful people. They really yeah, are. Yep. Yeah, they are. They are. So, so you know, anything that you know, there's a, there's a lot of good people out there in this industry, and there are a couple of them. And yeah. uh, and, and yeah, but the other thing is, I'd still like them even if their vest wasn't good. Right. They're just nice people. But yeah. the great thing is their vest is good and, and therefore I can recommend it. So Yeah, they yeah. got a, they got a slam dunk with yeah. this product and, yeah. and who they are. Yeah, they do. They For do. Sure. And the and the shooters, you know, if you haven't tried one, you need to go try one. That's very well yeah. said. And, and if you and if you're six foot five and two hundred and sixty, sixty five pounds, you can try mine. Yep. <laughs> and if and if you're six foot four and three fifty, you can try mine. <laughs> there you go. There you go. And if you're five two and what uh, what what is that what is that motion there? I sorry, I just told Sean he was number one. <laughs> anyway, this is uh the end of this segment. Was there, so was, was there some was there something that was fixing to get edited out? Uh, yeah. yeah. I think so. Luckily this isn't a video podcast. Right. So, so but no. <laughs> okay. We're getting we're getting way off track here. Um Bruce, seriously, thank Corral you very much for spending yeah. a few minutes with us. We really appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, it was great hearing from you and we're glad you like the vest, and I'm sure Eric and Heather will be thrilled to hear about it. And, and listen, thank you guys for what y'all are doing. It, it 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 means a lot to people. You know, they they love the sport so much, and you've got you guys are taking an interest in it as well. And uh, you you spread news and you get information out there to people, and it's just a it's just a great thing. So well, we keep up the good keep up the good work. We appreciate the kind words, Bruce. Yeah, we really thank, do. Thank you very much. Right, sir. Guys. Appreciate it. All right, we'll talk to you soon. All right, have All a good right. night. Good night. Hey, shooters. When you're traveling, protect your gun in the finest case available. Negrini is a sponsor of the Dead Pair podcast. And right now, use the promo code DEADPAIR, that's DEADPAIR, all one word, for a 10% discount off your order. Plus, if your order totals more than $300, they're going to throw in free shipping. Remember, Negrini, we case your memories. 
What do you think, Sean? That was pretty cool catching up with the Bruce. Yeah, absolutely. And then that's going to be a neat new segment. Every month we'll pick, uh, or uh, Heather and Eric will send us a uh, a customer that bought a bear pelt vest. We'll at talk, a random. At a random. And then we'll talk to them a little bit about what they like, what they uh uh, how they've how they've uh, shot with it, how they've uh, performed with it, and what you know, what are the, some of the features that they really dig? So again, I don't know. It 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 sells itself. You put one on, and man, they're just great. Right, but anybody that buys a bear pelt vest has a chance to be part of this. Is eligible, and you can right. come on here and be a part of the Dead Pair podcast. So uh, make sure that you guys uh, contact Eric and Heather, get those vests ordered, and uh, maybe we'll talk to you soon here. Well, let's think about that. So for one hundred and thirty dollars, they're going to get. Probably one of the best, if not the best, on the best vest. Try and say that three times fast. No. Best vest on the planet, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Okay. They're going to get to put all their cool sponsors on there. They can design their own vest, right, with the dye sublimation. And you're going to get a chance to come on and talk to us two meatheads. I don't know. I'm not sure how big of a benefit that is, but. Especially talking to you, right, but. Right. You know, me, now that'd be an honor. I but. was actually going to go the other way with that. But. <laughs> I figured you were. <laughs> <laughs> hey, not to change the subject, but um, we got a little note from Jolene Carnabucci from C4. and I wanted Oh, to, this is, yeah, this yeah. is super cool. I wanted to mention this real quick. So C4 is holding uh, their second annual clay therapy for charity. Uh, it's an NSCA registered shoot to raise money for the Sub-Zero Mission, which is an organization um, who provides articles of warmth for people um, basically their, their tagline is that nobody should freeze to death in America. And obviously up here in the North, uh, part of the United States, it gets pretty chilly. And, uh, sometimes it's hard for people to either pay their electric bills or maybe they don't have, uh, blankets or coats. Um, so this organization does a lot to contribute to people in need. Um, and this is on September the 11th. Yeah. So it's, it's September 11th, um, 9 a.m. to 8 p.m. at C4 shooting and, and training center in Madison, Ohio. They're going to have a registered shoot, 100 stand or 100 sporting, 55 stand. Um, you can register on win score. Uh, they're going to have a raffle with guns and ammo and optics, all kinds of stuff. They're going to have a Chinese auction. They're going to have a, they're also offering now full automatic machine gun firing. So you can buy a magazine. Uh, to shoot for charity. Uh, they're also going to have dinner provided by Miles Farmers Market. HOA and class winners get to choose their prizes from the prize table, and there's going to be a trophy for HOA uh, at the main event and HOA of the five-stand event. So Plus, uh, we I shot th- this last year, and it was a good event. It was yeah. definitely a good event. Oh, absolutely. And the, and the guns they give away are huge. Yeah, really um, nice. Really nice. The They're also doing the Claybot raffle that yes. same weekend yes and this is huge i mean you're you're talking two clay bots um these, with the throwers right? right and these are the big articulating models i mean this four-wheel drive i mean yeah, these just are the top of the absolute line. geek out yeah you know, if you're a shooter and you you want to have your own robotic clay throwing machine you can win a pair of them from C4 by purchasing a raffle ticket. But uh, yes. all this stuff's coming up again uh, real soon. And if you need more information, uh, you can get on C4's uh, website, www.c4shootcenter.com. Uh, or you can also call and talk uh, to one of the people there. Their number is 440-477-6056. Yeah. Sean, this has been a really big show. Yep. Um, big as far as... The quality of guests we've had on, we've—I mean, Olympic medal winner. Come on, man! I mean, how do right? we? How, how high do we set the bar? Yeah, and then of course we got to catch up with Bruce. Yep, um, that's been awesome. I mean, looking forward to getting down there. Uh, I know he's the new manager there at Blackjack. Love to get down there and see what he's done with the place. Yep. Um, you know, I talked to him on the phone earlier in the week, and he's done a ton of work. But man, he sure does love his bear pelt vest. Yeah, and I mean, who who doesn't? Come right? on, come on. Gutman Barrels back on Monday, and the heat index on Tuesday was 101 degrees. Yeah. Nasty. I put my bear pelt practice vest on, no shade, and I didn't feel any different when I took it off than when I put it on. What I what I mean by that is my chest, and you know, my t-shirt wasn't covered in sweat. Right. Okay. I felt like I didn't have anything on. If it wasn't for the shells in my pockets, I would have not known that I had that vest on. Hey, speaking of which, do you remember... Doug Kirkendall, KNL Ambo, mm-hmm. I don't mean to change the subject, talking about how the game board shells don't recoil. They don't punch you and they push you. Yeah, yeah. I it's kind of like a slow push versus, a, versus a, sla- a snap or a slap. Guess what? With Rhino porting, those 1,300 one-ounce white golds 
I don't feel anything. Nice. No, you can't shoot my Kohler at the next competition. Sorry. I don't want to shoot your Kohler at the next competition. I just want to take it out for a test drive. Um, 100 bucks a shot. We can set something up. All right, well, then never mind. I'll just... <laughs> now, you quit fooling around. Send that DT-11. I'm... Send those barrels down there and get them done. I'm going to. I just Stop want... it. I wanted to let you be the guinea pig. Oh, and then once I knew you were happy, that... I'm going to go ahead and send this off. You so. know what? Oh, man. Y'all see what I got to deal with every week? No, I'm, right. I'm just smarter. That's all. Hey, listen. <laughs> big shout out. <laughs> Shut up, Sean. <laughs> big, big shout out. Game board, Negrini, RE Ranger, Atlas Traps, and Bear Pelt. Thank you very, very much for supporting us. We we really appreciate the, the love that you all show us. Yeah, no doubt. We, we appreciate all, this, all the sponsors. And, hey, remember, take somebody out new shooting, uh, make some memories, get out there, um, and uh, what? Also, to add to that, to take to someone new shooting, based on the emails we've got this week, take someone new competing. Yes, absolutely. If if somebody that you know is a recreational shooter, even if they don't want to necessarily register right off the rip for the NSCA, bring them out and let them shoot the uh, hunters class. Yeah, and at least get them you know experience with how a tournament goes and how it flows, and then maybe they won't be so intimidated by it. Yeah, if you're used to shooting register targets, take your buddy that's the weekend warrior, take him with you one time. Yeah. Show him why we love this. Absolutely. You know, get him signed up, get him started. And then just hide from his wife because she'll be ready to hang well, out. Well, it depends. You know, you get somebody like Holly Turner that was on our very first episode. Yeah. And then she's, she's more, out. She's more hooked into it. She than, buys more guns right? than you do. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, hey, everyone, we're going to run. But, Sean, we will all see you the next time right here at the Dead Pair Podcast.